quick tutorial. Um, I went over some of this in class, so I won't be going uh, back and forth to show you live interaction. I'm just going to go over a bunch of the issues. Um, I actually recommend you have a, an Octave MATLAB uh, window open next to you as I go through this. Maybe you can type some of these and sort of see how they go, just so you get a better feel for what's going on. So we're going to overview, start with getting harder, getting some help, looking at some variables, looking at matrices, some plotting functions, some programming functions, functions and scripts and how they work in MATLAB, which is really part of your programming stuff, files and I.O. and some miscellaneous stuff at the end. So Octave is the open source version of MATLAB. It's a great GNU plot wrapper. It's a great tool to work with. You can get it for free from www.octave.org. You can get MATLAB from mathworks.com for whatever they're going to charge you to based on your organization. Um, they're high level programming languages um, with lots of stuff for linear algebra, good for visualization. Rapid prototyping for certain kinds of programming. I don't really consider them a true programming uh, environment, but they're good for rapid prototyping for algorithm development and very good at computational stuff like linear algebra, optimization, control, statistics, lots of toolboxes. Uh, but beware, these systems can be pretty slow when you go to work with them. So uh, MATLAB is a little bit more flexible, has more advanced features, a bunch of things you can do in MATLAB you can't do in Octave um, with some of the advanced toolboxes. You could do them in Octave if you were to write those toolboxes yourself, but they come pre-loaded in MATLAB, um, but also a lot more costly. Uh, my company spend, was spending about $1,800 a year for, for each seat of MATLAB for my engineering team. Um, Octave is free. Um, it's definitely good enough for this class. In fact, for much of my company, um, engineers would work on Octave if they didn't have access to one of the MATLAB licenses, and they can do almost everything they need to. There are some minor differences in syntax, but if you work carefully, you can do them pretty well. Um, most of this will apply to both Octave and MATLAB, unless otherwise stated. Um, you can install Octave locally by downloading it, www.octave.org. It's really easy in both Linux and pretty easy in, in uh, Mac. Uh, for Windows, I recommend the uh, Ming GW version, which is easier to install, but it's still a little bit tricky. Um, and you can access MATLAB on campus at UCCS by going to the VPM for the uh, class uh, VMware. So you go through the VPN, you install it, and if you go to this website of www.ucc.edu, EAS, EAS underscore CLAAS.html, if you go to that, you can uh, get instructions about how to download the VMware client and then how to access it, which is what I showed in class the other day. So um, quickly reviewing, getting started. So to start Octave, you at the shell prompt or the, the thing you type Octave. However you start the program, you'll end up with a text prompt that says Octave. Um, if you get yourself into trouble inside that, you can interrupt Octave by typing Control C or typing the words quit or exit, and you should probably do that. Um, if you're in the middle of a program, though, Control C will interrupt it, just like it will many programs in a Unix type environment. Uh, you can type get help by typing help or doc. You can say help for the name of the command, so help size, help plot, help inverse, um, you can get help in the help system by saying help help and quit um, in a very normal way. Um, older versions of MATLAB, um, you could get a little bit of confusing results because they would capitalize the name of functions, but actually in the system they're all lowercase, so just remember uh, functions, built-in functions tend to be lowercase. Whatever functions you define, of course, will be whatever text they want, um, and case matters. Okay, so let's look at so variables and matrices in MATLAB, everything's at some level really thought of as a matrix. So well, matrices are really complex, the obvious things. Uh, even strings are characters or matrices, and we can have some structures where you can have data types within them. Uh, MATLAB has a little bit more formal stuff with respect to object-oriented classes, but almost everything's a matrix. So vectors, well, they're a matrix with either one row or one column. Uh, scalar, like the number seven, well, that's a matrix of dimension one by one. Integers, well, if you want an integer, it's actually a double. You don't have to worry about it, and it's actually a... Matrix of size one by one in general, unless you put matrix, integers and matrices, and then they're still really doubles. Um, Boolean, so true or false, uh, is really an integer, which is, of course, really a double. So anything that's not null is true, zero is false. Um, so when I play with things, uh, things are pretty simply typed. I can say A equals, and I have a square bracket to open defining a matrix in octave. Um, so 8 to 1, that's the first row, semicolon, uh, minus one, four, seven, uh, semicolon, right? So that gives me a three by three matrix. Um, we'll talk a lot more about those later. Um, in general, MATLAB and Octave will pretty print your matrices and show them to you one row at a time, so you can feel for what they are. Uh, characters or 
Character strings are just uh, arrays, so you can actually index them. So string hello world is a matrix of, what is it, 10, 11 characters. Um, so uh, Octave will use double quotes, but I really recommend that you use single quotes because that's what MATLAB uses, so always use single quotes for your strings. It makes it easier to go back and forth between the two. Um, structures in both MATLAB and Octave are a name of a, the, the data variable, dot, and then the name of the field. Um, you can define these on the fly, so you can simply add structures. So if I didn't have data defined, I'd just say data.id equals 3. Now I have an object called data that has a field called id. Um, and you can add fields whenever you need to, which is both good and bad. From a programming point of view, if you have a typo, and I said data.di equals 3 instead of data.id, hey, you just made a new thing. Be careful with it. Um, if you want to construct, create arrays of structures or arrays of data, you index the array by using the round brackets, so data sub 2.id equals 4. This just made data, which before was just a struct, to now a 1 by 2 struct array containing these fields. Um, if I go into the array and I add a field to the second element that doesn't belong to the first, it'll be added to both of them and it'll just be null in the first one. Um, if I want to see a variable, I just type its name and it'll tell me the pretty printed value. So if I just say a, it'll tell me what a is. Um, if I want to suppress output, I'm going to add a semicolon. Um, that's not so useful in the command line, but it's extremely useful in programs when every line is going to be interpreted, so you don't want to see most of what they're doing. Um, this also applies to function calls, so semicolon is your way of eating data. Um, for those familiar with programming in C or whatever, the Java, you might think of a semicolon here as the end of line for your program so that it doesn't display anything. By default, otherwise it'll print a lot of stuff out. Um, very important that in MATLAB and in Octave, variables have no permanent type. So if I say s equals 3, follow the line s equals quote octave quote, um, that's perfectly fine. And here s was a integer, and then it became a character array. And if on the next line you go back and forth and assign it again, you'll get that. Um, there is no strong typing. There's no permanent typing. Be very careful. If you make a typo, for those of us who are dyslexic, you're going to do this. It'll just gladly make up stuff for you and give you values. Um, if you're trying to figure out what variables you have, you can use a command called who or whose um, to list the currently defined variables, and that'll show you a lot of data about what you have. Um, there's some built-in variables. For example, for floating point precision, you can find out the minimum number you can represent that's not zero, the maximum number you can represent, the epsilon precision for your machine. There's a bunch of stuff like that, not very particularly interesting. Um, if I want to talk about how to display what variables are being printed on the command line, every time I print data, so I can say format short, it'll show things with only five digits. Format long, it'll show stuff with 15 digits. Format short E, which will show floating point format with an exponent with five uh, living digits, and so on. Um, this controls the default printing output, which is the only way you really get to see most of your data. Um, when you're dealing with numbers, you can, of course, want to truncate them or do other things. So there's a bunch of built-in operators for the ceiling, which will round the smallest integer not less than x, the floor, the largest integer not greater than x, round, which is by far the most useful one, and then fix, which is round towards zero. Um, if these functions here just show x, if x is a number, it'll round a number. If x is a matrix, it's applied to each of the elements of the matrix separately. Um, and in fact, lots of operators in MATLAB are defined that way. You can apply them to a number because it's just a matrix of size one by one or by a 10 by 10 matrix. And unless there's some predefined approach, it'll apply them element by element. So matrices are a fundamental thing, so let's look at them. So we already saw this example. Um, to delimit columns, I use either a comma or a space between my data. And to delimit the ends of rows, I use semicolons. The following two expressions, one has got spaces between them, one's got semicolon, uh, commas, that's both perfectly fine. Um, if I want to create a matrix, it'll print it, print it when I'm done, unless I put a semicolon. Um, there's a bunch of other ways I can do stuff. So I can use values. So I can, first example, decide um, PHI is pi divided by 3, and then I can define a 2 by 2 rotation matrix. R equals cosine phi minus sine phi, semicolon, sine phi cosine phi, and I get r, right? So you're allowed to use expressions in expressions while you're defining matrices. That's perfectly fine. You can be computing things. Um, I can create a matrix from a matrix. So if I have a and b as these matrices, at 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, and the number 33, 33, I can concatenate two matrices just by putting square brackets in the two matrices. They have to be conformant. So in this case, um, I have 
a two by three and a two by one. And so when I concatenate them, I get a four by two. Um, I can also concatenate, concatenate them row wise. So I can put something in the bottom by taking a semicolon and then square bracket now three, a three by one matrix. And I get that uh, a one by three and I get something on the bottom. Um, I can actually index into row things in a bunch of different ways. So indexing is always row before column. So every time you do it, it's always in terms of rows and columns or in three or four dimensions, you know, each of the dimensions. Um, so if I want to say to get the ith and jth element of a matrix, I can say a open parenthesis i comma j, and that'll give me that element. But I can also get an entire row, which is then a vector. So I can a open parenthesis i comma colon. This special colon operator says, give me all the stuff that's in that, that row or that column. I can get a column, a open parenthesis, column, comma, j. And I can actually use range operators to get a submatrix. So I can say open a, a open parenthesis, i, comma, k, comma, j, comma, 1. So I could say a open parenthesis, 1, co colon, 2, comma, 2, colon, 4. And I get you know, a 2 by 2 matrix out of something. Um, there's a very special operator called n when you're not sure how long something is. I can say, given some data, V equals data starting at the third element going until the end, and you'll see it starts here at the third element, one, two, three, not zero, one, two, one, two, three, and goes into the end of the matrix. So that can be pretty useful for getting parts of the data out. So we saw the colon operator here, which is a pretty important operator to make sure when you understand what's going on in MATLAB. The colon really has two meanings. It's either select an entire row or an entire column, right? and you have to get it out of its interpretation there. Or it can be used to define a range. So I can say indices equals 1 colon 5. And that's actually now just the numbers 1 through 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will be assigned into the vector indices. So when I do that, I can actually add an element to say how I want to step. So I can go steps equals 1 colon 3 comma 61, which is going to return a row vector uh, going 1, 3, 4, or sorry, 1, 4, 7, whatever, stepping by 3 each time. Notice it's not start, end, step, it's start, step, end. Start at one, step by three, end when you're greater than or equal to 61. Not quite the uh, obvious thing for many of you. But, um, and I can do that with floating point numbers just as well as integers, so I can start at zero, I can add 0.01 and stop when I get to be greater than or equal to one. It doesn't have to be equal, it can be greater than and then it'll still stop as well. Um, there's a nice function called lin space that will let you define uh, ranges and then reuse them in other operations as well. So we've now seen that we can actually get to um, elements of a matrix. So if I've gotten a matrix, a3 comma colon refers to the third column. Well, I can actually assign something to that. I can say a3 comma colon equals minus 3. And the third column of this matrix, instead of being, oh, sorry, the third row, uh, will be uh, changed. I can also reference a row or column that doesn't exist. So um, I can say a four comma colon, which says access the fourth row and don't care what column you're in, adds four. And now this matrix up here has been changed to be one, two, minus three, four, two, two, minus three, four. So this row was changed by this statement here, which said access the third row, don't care what column it is, add the minus. And then we added a whole other row just by doing things. So again, be careful when you're operating in these because if it doesn't exist, it won't complain. It'll just do it for you and add a new row, new column, or change a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I can delete a column by assigning it the special empty matrix. So if I say a2 comma colon equals empty square bracket, I've just deleted the second row. And I can delete parts of rows. I can say a colon comma one, start at one, go to two, sorry, uh, start at one, add, by, add two, and go to five, and delete all of those. So this is just iterated through deleting the first, third, and fifth uh, rows out of the matrix. Doesn't have a fifth one, but it's okay to go ahead and do that. Um, so when you're playing with matrices, there's lots of these operators, the colon operator and the range operators can allow you to access bulk data in interesting and complicated ways. Um, because you can play with matrices, you also want to be able to ask questions like, what can I do with them? So you can ask questions like the number of rows, the number of columns. So the size operator tells you a lot about it. 
It's a 3D matrix, size A sub 3 will tell you that's third dimension. Um, you can get those and put them in a matrix, so I can have square bracket N, R, N, C. This just to find a matrix that both exists as a matrix, uh, because it'll be printed out, but it actually defined R, N, R, and N, C at the same time. So functions that return matrices allow you to access the return results by building a matrix on the left-hand side. Um, we can ask some questions like length, the number of elements, is it empty? Um, and uh, Octave defines a few functions just to make it easier for when you're typing of rows and columns. And if you're working purely in Octave, that's okay. Um, if you're working in MATLAB, you can actually get around this. I like to do this in MATLAB as well by just defining the functions rows and columns. They're not built in, but they're so trivial to define, you can include them in your code. So the matrices come with all the standard matrix operators. I can do things like take a matrix and multiply by a constant. So I can say B equals 3 times A. I can add and multiply. So if A and B are the right shapes, then I can say A times B plus X minus D um, and uh, do that. Um, now, it'll actually do this because the multiply, they do have to be consistent. When I go to add them, if the X happens to be a number, it'll gladly add a number to everything. So be a little bit careful with that if you forget what's going on. Um, it'll add a constant to every element if, it can't, uh, if this number is a one by one. Um, you can do things like transpose, invert a matrix, and you can then mix them together and do operations. So if V is a one by N vector, I can talk about V transpose times an n by n matrix times an n by one vector, and I get a number. I can ask questions we'll talk about later, so we already know what the determinant is, but we'll also be able to do things like eigenvalue and SVD in a single command and, and get them very, very quickly. In fact, there's tons of operators. If you want to do it with a matrix, MATLAB probably got some functions to do it. Um, vector, vectors are just special matrices, so, oops, um, so I can talk about things like a column vector and do x transpose times x, get the inner product, the dot product, that gives me a scalar. I can do the outer product, x times x prime. Um, if I just take x times x, is a 1 by n by a 1 by n. That's not allowed. It'll complain. Um, I can do element-wise operators. I can do x dot plus x, x dot times x, x dot divide x, x dot cubed, or the power operator. These are true for matrices or vectors. Notice this is not like adding a scalar to every element. It's taking two matrices, which might be five by five, and element-wise adding them, which is what addition means. But for multiplication, this is very different. This is now going to take a point-wise multiply for each element. Um, so there's a bunch of other useful functions. I can talk about the sum of the elements, the cumulative sum of the elements, the product of the elements, the cumulative product, the difference as I walk through them, the mean value, the standard deviation, the min, the max. Um, I can sort them, if, especially if it's, a, if it's a vector, it's useful. Um, sorting a matrix is not quite as meaningful, but you can unravel it and do that. Um, you can find a, you can use the find operator, which is sort of interesting. It will return a vector of all the non-zero elements in V. So it's, if you put these together with vectorized operations, you can do something very interesting. So if I wanted to find all the indices in the vector data vector, or the matrix, data vector equals, uh, I can say data vec equal equals five, and then it'll tell me all the locations where that's true. So I can then use that in specialized operations. There are, of course, special matrices, things like the zero matrix, easy to make, uh, matrix of all ones, the identity matrix, notice it's EYE, not just an I, a diagonal matrix with a bunch of data, and if you like to play with magic squares, you can have a magic square any size you want. I can generate random matrices, um, and I can have them be uniformly distributed or normally distributed, and I can do one where I take all the numbers one to n, and I can randomly permute them and put them someplace. So this could be useful if I want to like access stuff in some random order. Um, the others are more useful for actual matrix operations. Um, Everything's uh, multi-dimensional, so if I want a three-dimensional matrix, I can say ones of two, three, five. This will give me a matrix that has actually got three dimensions, which will print out a lot. And then the colon operator does the, uh, accesses the first things indexed by the first index, the second index, and the third index. So I can say colon, colon, one, and I'll get a bunch of ones, or colon, colon, two. I'll get a bunch of uh, ele uh, secondary elements, and so on. Um, I can also use operators to create, index, assign, delete, and get the sizes in a similar fashion no matter what the size is. 
So the size operator for a 3D matrix will give me M, N, and L. Um, rand of uh, M, N, and L will give me 3D matrix full of data. Min, all these operations do the same kinds of thing. As you can guess, you can add other dimensions. Um, just like I could assign to a field that didn't exist, I can assign to a dimension that didn't exist, and now it'll have that dimension. Um, I mentioned the word unravel before. It's a common term when talking about MATLAB. Given a matrix A, I can change its shape to produce another shape. So if I had a matrix that was, say, 10 by 10, I could ask it to become, I could call reshape A 100, 1, or A 1, 100, or A 2, 50. As long as it ends up being 100 elements, it'll be happy. If it doesn't have exactly the right number of elements, it'll yell. I can shift all the elements in the matrix. I can shift the dimensions, so I can do um, sh uh, multidimensional transposes and play with them that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so if I go to play with them, you know, there's a bunch of operations I can do. So if I let P be a 2n by 1 column vector, that is, it has n xy pairs, as you might get if you're trying to draw something in 2D. You can make a column vector out of it um, where I might want to have xy theta tuples where all the thetas belong, values being p, pi over 2. Then I can actually combine that by calling the reshaper operator where I'm going to take p, I'm going to want it to be 2 times whatever the number of elements of p are divided by 2. So now I've reshaped it. Now I'm going to assign the third row. So I took my 1D vector, I made it a 2D vector. Now I'm going to take that, I'm going to make it a, a vector uh, matrix where I have a third column, and then I can reshape that back to be a 3 by n, 1 column. So notice this is sort of an odd way of, I'm going to insert a third value every, or a value every third element. So now I'm going to be able to, to do operations. So you can massage matrices in, in interesting ways to uh, uh, reorder or modify data. So strings are a special kind of matrix we already mentioned. Um, there are operations to allow you to concatenate strings, to convert them to integers or to numbers, um, and to pretty print them. It's very similar to uh, C, C++ is fprintf for strings, where I can combine a bunch of things. So I can just concatenate raw strings. Um, I can actually, however, use the sprintf function to, to produce things using that syntax if you're used to it. Um, MATLAB has virtually all the common string and parsing functions, so if you used to see in C++ things like string compare, be careful, it's string compare does weird things if you're not sure what it's doing, string token, uppercase, lowercase, fine, fine, There's tons of tons of things going on. So if you're used to seeing C++, a lot of that is just passed right through MATLAB and Octave. So there's some fun things we can do with plotting, and this will be important for your first programming assignment, so um, as we go through this. So plotting in 2D allows me to very quickly put stuff together, so if I call plot, with x and cosine of x, where x is some vector, it'll generate a figure window, and then it'll draw a figure that has x on the x-axis and cosine of x on the y-axis, and plot that as a data. Um, I can create, by default, this is figure 1. I can also just call figure sub n, and it'll change to a new figure, so I can have multiple windows open at the same time. Um, if the figure window already exists, it'll bring it into the foreground. Otherwise, it'll make a, current, uh, it'll make a new figure. Every time you do a plot command, a command, a plot command in MATLAB or an octave is always operating on the current figure. So if I have more than one, it'll draw in whatever one is considered current. If I say figure sub n, that becomes the current one. Um, if I haven't done anything else, I can just say figure, and then I can continue issuing a series of plot commands to, to put it together. So if I want to plot a series of xy patterns, so if I have two curves I want to plot, I can say plot x cosine x, x cosine, or x sine x, x x squared, um, x dot x squared, right? so this is applying the, the squaring operator to each element of x, and this will actually be a, a, a plot with three curves. I recommend you go try this, make sure you understand how to do that. Um, given my plot, I can do things like put text on it, so I can say legend, uh, quote, cosine x, quote, sine x, quote, x squared, and then it'll put that legend on my plot. Um, you can also do things by using a command called hold on. So given that I have a figure, I can plot one thing. By, I can say hold on, I can plot one thing, plot a second thing, plot a third thing. Otherwise, the second plot command will overwrite it and say oh, I want a new plot, it'll just overwrite the old one. So hold on and then hold off will we'll stop it from accumulating more stuff. 
Um, I can clear a figure, I can do hold on, it'll keep track of stuff, um, turn a grid on, turn a grid off, I can add titles and access labels and subplots. If you, if you do help on plot, you'll see there's a whole bunch of things controlling the axes, whether or not they're square axes or equal, put my arbitrary marks on them, limit them, add boxes, lots of stuff to do with plotting. And this is actually one of the values, both MATLAB and Octave makes it pretty easy to, and quick to look in, at your data. Um, so we'll go through an example or two. Um, I can also play with colors and symbols. So plot x cosine x quote r plus is a special formatting instruction that says make it red for the r and make it a cross for the plus or make it a plus. Um, and uh, there's lots of lines and style colors. So again, help plot will show you all that. So as an example, if I said x equals lin space 0 2 pi 100, that's going to give me a vector that starts at 0, goes to 2 pi, and has 100 points in it, which is easier than guessing whatever the, the increment should be. Then you can do a command like plot x cosine x with the red plus, x sine x with a black x, and that'll, or uh, blue x, sorry, uh, black is x, okay, and that'll give a plot that looks something like this. And if you can't do that, you should go back and play in MATLAB and Octave until you get it done. Um, you can adjust the axes, so you can give them a particular size, or you can say axis tight, it'll compute the smallest set of axes, it'll show all the data. You can add legends, put some titles on it, add some labels. Again, you might want to practice all this, it'll be useful for your assignment. Um, and then when you get done, you'll have a plot that looks like this. Sorry about the stuff being cut off there. Um, on the Mac, it does some little bit weird things. Um, the plot function, uh, I probably could fix it, but I just haven't bothered. Um, the plot function uh, on the bottom showing you all this. Um, but uh, ah, you don't like that, you want to try again, I'll clear it off, start over. Um, you can play some games with the sizes of the markers, um, add some more text. Um, this is a special syntax you'll hear is cosine slash phi. This is actually what we call latex syntax. Uh, latex is a text formatting tool used very commonly in mathematics um, in our papers. I do most of my proposal, proposals and papers in LaTeX actually. Um, and it produces nice looking mathematical symbols. So now you'll see I've got sign this Greek phi in there. I've got my plot going on and I can put all that data together. So you like that. Now you want to print it out. Um, you can export it as uh, an EPS file. So you can say print minus DEPS, my, something dot EPS. Um, you can make it color. You can export it as a JPEG image. You can export it as a PNG image with various resolutions. Um, tons of stuff you can do with that. Um, all of this can be actually called as a function. So I can say print and pass these arguments. This becomes very useful inside your program when you want to print a plot, say, every time through a loop because you're doing a movie. And then you just save a bunch of frames and you put them all together. Um, there's a ton of stuff you can do. We didn't even touch on them. So there's specialized functions for things like histograms, pie charts, areas, filling contours, dealing with scatter plots, log plots, log log plots, semi-log plots, stair steps, playing with images, tons and tons of stuff. So there's a lot to do. And of course, that's all in 2D. I can move to the 3D and plot stuff in 3D, do mesh plots, surface plots. Um, most 3D plots have uh, 3D or 2D commands have 3D siblings. So things like 3D pie chart, a quiver chart in 3D, a scatter plot in 3D, and so on and so on. Okay. So there's a lot of plotting you can do. It's one of the powerful things for both MATLAB and Octave. Now let's get into programming. So programming, one of the things to remember here, everything starts with 1. So if I talk about V going from 1 to 10, V sub 0 will just give me an error. Um, things in MATLAB are case sensitive, so I have to be careful. If I'm using a text editor, um, you try and use a, a text editor with uh, M file syntax highlighting, coloring, uh, something like Emacs will gladly tell you when you're properly doing stuff inside of Octave. Um, I don't think Notepad will show you that, so you might want to look a little bit deeper. One of the nice things about Lab, MATLAB's user interface is it does have a text editor that shows you what's going on. It's pretty easy to use. Um, so first thing we need to do in programming is can we do an if statement, because that's sort of a fundamental thing with respect to is it Turing complete. So in MATLAB, a programming statement is if condition, comma, then body, semicolon, else if condition, comma, else body, else, else body, semicolon. Um, the semicolons help uh, eat up all the, the output of the data. 
Um, the else and else if clauses are, are optional. You can just have if condition end. Um, any else, any number of else if clauses may exist. So you can have this else if else if else else end. You don't have to have an end else. You can just do end. But if none of them are true, it'll just move on to the next. So we have control statements as well. If I want to do a bunch of conditions, I can do like switch and some expression. Uh, and then if that expression has the, the value of this label, it'll do this command. If it has a second label, it'll do the second command. Otherwise, um, the labels can be anything they want. They can be floating point values. So uh, you can be a little, bit, a little bit careful with those, but you can do them. Uh, while statements and for statements. So while some condition is true, do body end. For statements for variable equals expression body end. Um, how might I do then a for loop where the variable is going to go from 1 to 100 stepping by 2? Well, we've already seen that operator. We'd say for x equals 1 colon 2 colon 100. And it'll go from 1 by 2 stopping when it gets up to be over 100. Um, when I'm playing with loops, I have commands like break to jump out of the innermost for while loop that I'm working on, continue, um, which is only used inside of for or while loops. It skips over the rest of the body going to the, the, the next cycle. Not quite the same for these two as you might get in, for example, a switch statement in C. You can break. Don't do that here. Use these with care. They're both uh, not very good programming constructs. They'll often cause weird behaviors that you're not thinking about if you haven't thought through them. Um, in octave, there's a bunch of things that are very C-like for incrementing things, um, I++, I++, minus minus, A++, plus plus, whatever. Um, this applies both to scalars and to matrices. I actually recommend you don't get into these habits, both because they're uh, not going to be working in MATLAB, but also because they'll sometimes cause you problems, because if you start using them, then you accidentally do them to a matrix. It's not necessarily what you wanted to do. It'll just gladly do them and won't complain. Um, these are the equivalents of, of operators in C and C++. Um, the comparison operators, all comparisons return a value of 1, then it's true, otherwise it's 0. So i equal equals 6, comma, cond equals uh, d greater than theta. These are comparison operators, right? And they're either going to return true, uh, a value of 1, if this is true, and 0 otherwise. Um, I can actually do it in a matrix case, and then it's going to return. It's going to do it on an element by element basis. So if I have this two by two matrix, one, two, three, four, and I ask if it's equal equal to one, three, four, two, uh, one, three, two, four, I'm going to get the matrix one, zero, zero, one. Now in practice, you probably wouldn't do it with ex explicit scalars. You do it like with if a equals one, three, two, four, and then you get this result back out. Um, in the scale matrix to scalar case, it's compared against each element in turn. So 1, 2, 3, 4 is going to give me 0, 1, 2, 2. So if I do a comparison operator with a matrix, I get a matrix of the same shape back out as, the, as one of the two, if one is a scalar. If they're not actually the same, it'll complain. So they're either the same size, or one's a matrix and the other is a one by one, and then it expands it to make it work. Um, I can ask some other questions for, uh, for uh, vectors and matrices. I can ask if any element is true, so I can return one if any element of a vector is non-zero. So, for example, in this, I could say any on this result, and now I'll find out if any of them were actually true, if any elements had a value of two. I can also ask the question if all of them are true. And, of course, I can play that in various games with rows and columns. So, um, any and all row vectors correspond to column vectors. So, I can say any of any of C, which returns if one if any element of the matrix C is non-zero. So this first row of any is going to take out just one row at a time. So I, if I have multi-dimensions, I have to either unravel them by using the shape operator or apply multiple any's or all's. Um, so the standard relational operators, less than, less than or equal, 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 greater than or equal, greater than, not equal, not equal. This is only true in octave. Again, also in octave, not equal. Um, Boolean expression, so... I can take things that are either 0 or 1 and do Boolean expressions on them, and or not. Uh, logical not, again, only an octave. I don't recommend it. Um, short circuit operators, very much like in C. So if I say B and and B2, it'll evaluate B1, and only if it's not true will it evaluate uh, B2. If B1 is already false, then false and anything is already false, so it'll just stop. 
The OR short circuit does the same thing, where if B1 is true, it'll stop and won't evaluate these. Again, for, for constants or matrices, that's not so exciting, but when B1 or B2 could be a function call that's expensive, you might want to short circuit them and be more efficient. Um, there's some recommended naming conventions um, that I'm going to suggest you use. Um, underscore separated or lowercase for functions. So intercept line circle dot m. If you build a file called dot m, you also just now have access to that all the code in that file inside your thing by just using the, the function name. Um, if it's really a function. If it's just a script, I recommend you use uppercase, so localized robot or match scan. This way when you're looking at your code, you know the difference between a script that's going to do a whole bunch of independent commands and a function that you can call inside your code. These are conventions. You don't have to follow them. You can name things wherever you want. Sorry, I forgot one last thing. Um, the built-in MATLAB commands are all lowercase notation. They have no underscores or dashes. And so one of the reasons to add underscores to your own functions and caps to your scripts are so that you know when you're calling your code versus some built-in function. Okay, so what do I mean by functions in scripts? So MATLAB is complicated by the, the fact that you can define functions typically in an external file and then call them like a built-in function. So in the simplest form, the definition of function is basically a file that says function, some name, body, and end. And get used to the principle of only putting one function per file, called a .m file, and where you put them in. And so I have this function, and now I know what it is. It's in the file called name.m, and I'd be okay. Um, if I want to pass arguments to it, oh, this did not format well, um, you're going to write basically the function name square bracket the return value equals range and then open parenthesis the argument list body and end, where the argument list is a comma separated list of input arguments and the return value is a comma separated list of uh, output arguments. Notice that return var is a vector enclosed in square brackets. So this is a square bracket, that's a square bracket. And the arguments are open parenthesis, close parenthesis, so they're round arguments, so that'll help keep them straight. So here's uh, a simple example. I have a function that's going to return mu and sigma. It's called calculate moments. It's going to take an argument of data, and it's going to return mu equals the mean of the data, sigma equals the standard deviation of the data, and that'd be a function. I put that in a function called calcmoments.m. Uh, I can have another function, find first peak, so square bracket has peak i close square bracket finds peak data thresh indices equals find data greater than thresh. This is now using the find command to go find me all the indices of the array data where the data value is greater than thresh. And then I'm going to say if is empty indices. So I'm going to ask was it was this an empty list or was it there? Has peak equals zero and i is nothing. Otherwise has peak equals one and i equals the indices, and notice I'm going to return i. So i is either the empty array or the final uh, the results of indices, and then has peaks is either 0 or 1. So I define a very simple function to decide if my data has a, uh, something greater than the threshold. Maybe not the best name calling it has peaks, but it's above threshold. So um, I can play some C-like games having local variables, variable number of arguments using things like var arg, var in, var out. If you're not used to these, I don't actually recommend you play too much with them. I like functions that have normal numbers of arguments, well-known, so it's easier to keep the code clean, but lots of people like to use them, and you can. Um, so functions in their M file equivalent, so when you put them in there, calcmoments.m, findpeaks.m, and then to call it, once that's in the right directory, and it's important, MATLAB uses this concept of operational directories, once it's in there, you call it without the .m. So I would say square bracket bool i equals find first peak, open parenthesis, my readings for some array of data, comma 0.03, and it'll do that. Um, if you want to put comments in your functions, you should. It's good. They start with a percent. Make use of them. When you go to turn in code in this class, we expect to see lots of comments to explain what you're doing. Um, scripts. So the second type of M file is what's called a script. It's really a program that runs through a series. It's a text file with a .mx extension, and it basically executes codes. These are Quasi like a main program, but they don't have, they have an important difference. When they're done, your variables have been changed. So they're like a global uh, program. You execute a script by calling its name. So if I had something like localized robot.m, I would just say localized robot and it'll run. And again, comes with percents or comments. You can't repeat this often enough. You want to have comments in your code. So 
as you go to add the documentation, oh, these didn't uh, line up well, um, you can have uh, your comments as a block of code uh, beforehand. The first block of comments in the beginning of an M file is defined as the help task. So if I have a whole bunch of comments and then the, the beginning of a function, then if I say help in the name of your file, it'll go look in your file to see if there's a block of comments at the beginning. So that'll give you lots of uh, help you can get. Um, there's some specialized functions to use because it said you have to play with paths. So you can find out what is the current search path. It'll look in a se sequence of directories. If I want to, I can add a directory to the current directory search list by add path. I can remove one by remove path. If it's in there more than once, it'll remove the first occurrence. And I can save the current path list so I can use it later. Um, and that's useful because I might want to go look for new functions. So how do I add new functions if they're already in the directory? I add that directory to my path by saying add path in the name of that directory. So how about getting data in and out of this? Got to deal with file I.O. So uh, basically I can do some very simple things. I can save all of my current variables or all, all, all your things as a file. So I can basically save my vars.mat. We'll save all of your current variables into a, in a file called vars.mat. I can save a particular thing by saying save results.mat results data xy. That'll put results x and y into a .mat file. The .mat files are binary files that are much faster to load in and out of MATLAB and Octave, but they're also not human readable. If I want to save them in a form that you, you or I could read, you would save whatever with a dat ASCII, or if I want to force it to be MATLAB, I can say .mat. If I've saved the .mat file, I can load all the variables by saying load in the name of the mat, mat file. I can load variables and only select a few of them. So if there's 10 things in the file, I can, only, I can choose to get only one or two of them out. Um, and if it's an ASCII file that contains numbers in a matrix, then I need to load it by using the load command and pass it the name of the file and store the results into a variable. In both the load cases up here, they were already named variables when they were saved. And it's just going to go find them. They're already matrices. Here, i got to give it a name because the ASCII file doesn't know what it's supposed to be called. If I want to do smaller bits of I.O., I have C-like access to do things like f-open, f-close, f-print. So I can f-open a file with quote R, quote W, so I'm writing to it. Do an f-print to, to read them in using C-like syntax. If you don't know this, you'll have to do the help to find out more about it and close it. Um, this is for writing. I can do something similar for I.O. Um, if your program reads and writes from specialized files, Floating precision of fprint is crucial. You've got to be very careful to write numbers using the appropriate precision. So the above example, percent %f7.4 is actually not going to be a very good source for Gaussian random numbers because they only have four decimal digits. You really want to write them with, say, 20 or whatever the machine precision you're looking at, 16. Okay. Um, so for that reason, be careful how you're using them. Make sure you're not losing precision when you do I.O. like that. Um, there's a bunch of other functions that said for doing I.O. for reading files. There's read text, fscanf, get a line of data, read binary data, um, specialized functions to read and write images. So later on when we work with images, you can just read a JPEG or a PNG image as a single command. And help on any one of those will tell you more. Oh, so a few little things we have to worry about. Um, MATLAB and Octave are keeping lots of data. So if I want to clear up some stuff, I can delete a variable called A. Once it exists, I can sort of delete it. I can clean... Do, clear all the things that have a certain string in them. I can clear all the variables. I can clear everything, which is not uh, all the functions and forget everything I know by saying clear all. Um, clear without an argument is just all variables. I can close all the, the current window, figure window. I can close all the windows. I can clear the command shell, the history I've been working in, and get rid of everything. Um, I can display a variable in a sort of printed format. I can display it as a string uh, without the name of the string, so I can do this when I'm trying to do I.O. and make things look pretty good. Um, so if I said disp of quote done, it'll display done instead of answer equals done. Um, and it's uh, sort of like doing sprintf done or simply quote done. Um, so I don't see the, var the value, of the name of the variable, just the, the results of the I.O., which is useful. Uh, so MATLAB and Octave come with this idea of a command history. You can navigate up and down the command history using the arrow keys. If you know Emacs, you can use Emacs-like commands to move around as well. 
um, at least an octave. Um, the command history is start letter sensitive, so if I start typing on the command line, um, as I'm doing this, it'll go and find me the most recent history command that started with the letters you typed, and then you can try and complete them with a tab, so tab completion, um, if you start some commands that start with a few letters and hit tab, it'll try and tell you all the choices you have. Um, there's a lot of Unix-like commands. It's built on top of Unix, so PWD, LS, CD, MakeDir, RemoveDir, all these kinds of things. Um, you can also move files and copy files, which are not just MV and CP. They're actually called move file and copy, so you got to spell them out. Um, there's a bunch of stuff with respect to random numbers and random seeds. If you get into that, you'll have to worry about it. So... We talked a little bit about looking at them in practice. Um, there's a lot of other stuff you might have to do. Um, from it, you can generate output from a C, C++, Python, Java program in Octave, uh, uh, in octave sy syntax. Um, so we'll look at that very, very briefly. We'll talk about how you might do some animations, calling some Unix or DOS functions within Octave and doing, or MATLAB, and doing some things to increase speed. So if I want to, to read stuff uh, into Octave or MATLAB, I really want to write them out in a form where I have something like filteredreadings.txt. I have rows and columns of data, and then I can load it by just using the load command. In this case, it would, it would load a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 by 5 matrix um, called A. Um, I can have little bits of code snippets. So in a file, I can have a equals square bracket and then five by five matrix, figure one, clear the figure, hold on, plot the data and whatever. And I can call this plot figure readings.m. So now I have a code file that I can just run plot filter readings dot, uh, plot filter readings and it'll plot all the data. After it's done plotting that data, A has now been changed. This is one of the things to remember. Variables in MATLAB and Octave here are, are global. I call off to some function, I've changed A. Very Annoying if somebody else is also using A to them. Um, MATLAB, and, uh, MATLAB has a function called get frames and movie to make animated movies. Um, Octave doesn't yet have these, but uh, there's a pretty easy way to, to make a movie by um, exporting the frames to a directory using the print command and then using something like ImageMagick or QuickTime Pro to read a bunch of frames and make a movie. So you can still do it for free, um, which is actually the way I like to do stuff because then I get to see each of the frames and I can change what my compression rates are and whatever on the fly. In MATLAB, it's one big command and I have to redo it all if I'm not happy with the way the movie comes out. And compressions for many movies is a big thing. So just to go through an example, um, if I let data.txt contain a matrix and we want to plot each of the columns and save it as a frame of, of a movie, um, I would load the data. So now I have M and N as the size of the matrix and know how big it is. Define a figure. For i equals 1 to n, I'm going to plot 1 to m, and then a colon comma i. So this is going to give me the ith column of the data, and 1 to m is going to be the, the first set of data. So it's just going to give me the numbers 1 to m, and then the, the column data. It's going to print that. Uh, first, it's going to use sprintf to get a file name, which is going to be frames slash frame percent 0, 4, d, PNG I. So each time through the loop, it's going to make a four-digit thing. So it's going to be frame 0000, or sorry, 0001.png, frame 0002.png. Um, this percent four is useful because then the frames are actually all in with four digits, which makes it easier when I go to then play with uh, uh, Image Magic or FFmpeg to make a movie. And then it's going to print out that as a, a PNG image with 100 bits per uh, dots per inch and save that in file name, and then it'll put all this together. Um, the problem with this is that all of the axes might change because one axis might have a very different, so the verticals could be bouncing up and down. So you can actually do something to force it to freeze the axis um, by pr basically computing it. So I'm gonna make a plot command. I can add an axis that says 1m, the minimum value for the vertical axis, the minimum of the minimum of a, and the maximum of the maximum of a, and now I've Every one of these will have the same axis, which makes it a nice movie. Um, as I said, there's times we want to access things outside of the program. So from, we can get to Unix-like commands by saying Unix um, and, and getting them. On a PC, there's an equivalent command called DOS. So inside your Octave slash MATLAB program, you can call off an FTP files. You can go fire up a program to uh, run your code and compute some data file, do whatever you want. Um, 
these can be pretty powerful handling when you're dealing with certain things. For example, I might have something that'll run through at the end of my animation and call off to FFmpeg to make a movie out of the sequence of frames. Um, so um, MATLAB as a programming language is, is you have to be a little bit careful. Writing loops, for loops, while loops in MATLAB, they're evil. They're very slow. They're very slow. In MATLAB, doing things as a vector is much more efficient. So if I want to work on a whole bunch of data, it's better to work on it as a vector. And I'll show you an example um, in terms of that. So if I define this case uh, phi as uh, starting at zero, going to two pi with 100,000 steps in front of it, and I try and do something like um, i equals one the length, sine phi equals sine of phi of i, this will be really, really slow compared to doing something like sine phi equals sine of phi. Most of the built-in functions are vectorized, which means you can give them a vector as an argument and you're going to get the vector applied, sorry, the, the function applied to each element of the vector as a vector argument. Most of the built-in commands are vectorized and you want to learn to think vectorized if you want any kind of speed. Um, you can also, if you're going to do stuff, um, you just can't avoid for loops or while loops, then make sure you pre-allocate stuff. Um, as I said, you can always add stuff to a matrix. You can append to the right-hand side. So I could write a loop that goes for i equals 1 to 100, a i comma colon equals a bunch of random numbers. Each time through, it's going to add a new row, and that turns out to be slow. Much faster if I say a equals 0 of 100 by, by uh, 50, and then have exactly the same loop. Notice the loops here are exactly the same. All I did was pre-allocate, but I'll probably get it to run 5 to 10 times faster, um, depending on the length of the loop when I go to do that. Um, Accessing the structure of arrays, it's, it's important to understand what you're doing. Um, a structure of arrays is much more efficient than an array of structs. Um, it has much less memory and a corresponding speed benefit. So if I say data.x equals uh, from 0 to 2 pi with steps of 100 and delta y, uh, data.y equals sine of x of data, that's going to be much better than if I try to make x as, an, uh, as a structure that has lots of points in it and lots of data. Um, arrays of structs, some people, some name, people.age, these are allowed. They're just not as efficient if you have a struct with an array inside of it. So that's giving you a very fast uh, introduction. Um, hope you've enjoyed this. Hopefully you can work through this. As you go through your first program assignment, you can go back to the uh, PowerPoints. But um, given that you've seen this stuff, you've seen it once, my recommendation after that is try the help command. It's pretty helpful.